My name is Adrian Otto, and I'm your project team lead for the Magnum Project. And I'm ready to give you an update on what we've accomplished and where we're going. So before I get started, um, I want to give you some quick background about what Magnum is and how it works, for those of you that aren't already familiar with it. Magnum is an API service that allows you to create container clusters on your OpenStack cloud. It uses your existing identity credentials. It allows you to choose what type of cluster you'd like to create. It has a full multi-tenancy solution. And it allows you to quickly create those clusters, including advanced features. So in the example of um, our popular Kubernetes driver, it'll allow you to create a multi-master cluster in a matter of a few minutes, which isn't possible with other prevailing tools that are used to create uh, these kind of clusters. The project has been around since the Kilo release of OpenStack. Um, in the latest release, there were 28 active contributors. And according to the user survey, the OpenStack user survey, um, only 3% of the clouds are currently running Magnum, but 37% of them are planning it. So there's an there's a adoption rate that is, um, that is ramping up at the moment. We know almost 10% of them are currently testing Magnum. Now there's some terminology I'm going to be using um, that will sound foreign to you if you're not used to Magnum speak. Uh, COE refers to Container Orchestration Engine. So this is the software that you run on your Magnum cluster to do the orchestration of your containers. Now we have a, um, a modular uh, driver-based system where the actual COE type is pluggable. So you can choose between today, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Mesos, or DCOS. And it's possible to uh, create uh, new COE drivers of your own that are uh, either modified from this or use a different operating system, et cetera. And I'll talk about some ones that were added in the recent release. Uh, the next term you need to know is Magnum Cluster. So Magnum Cluster is a grouping of OpenStack cloud resources on which the COE runs. So it's the place where your container orchestration engine runs. So it's a bunch of Nova instances, a neutron network, security groups, load balancer resources, software configuration resources, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are organized in a heat stack that the Magnum cluster creates upon start or upon creation. And those clusters, once they exist, can be scaled up and down. So here at the bottom you see uh, the clusters running the COE are composed of Nova instances. You can add and subtract Nova instances. So you can start small and get large. You can start large and get small. Um, that's all built into the Magnum API. The third term is a cluster template. You can think of this kind of like a, a heat template. It's a, a way to easily create new Magnum clusters. And it's slightly different in that it's also represented as a cloud resource in the Magnum API, whereas heat templates are not. Heat templates are, are file artifacts that are presented to heat when a stack is created, whereas in Magnum, a cluster template resource is present through the API independent from a, a file artifact. So you can use them again and again without presenting the same file artifact again and again. It also means that as a cloud operator, you can create one of these things, mark it as public, and then all of your cloud users can then access these things without having to distribute a, a template file to everyone. Okay, and the fourth piece of um, terminology that we should cover is native client. So native to the COE is the important part here, not native to OpenStack. So in order to interact with the container clusters that Magnum creates, you use the native tool that goes along with that orchestration tool, not something that is unique to OpenStack or, or unique to any vendor. So in the example of if you create a Docker Swarm cluster, the tool, the native client is Docker. If you create a Kubernetes cluster, the native client is kubectl, et cetera, et cetera. So when your 
native client interacts with your cluster, it's going to present not an OpenStack identity credential, um, but it's going to be using TLS in order to do um, authentication and uh, access control. There are a number of differences between running an OpenStack cloud with Magnum in order to run a container orchestration system versus just taking a bunch of resources and setting it up yourself using scripts. Um, number one difference is you're going to get a multi-tenancy solution from top to bottom. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is systems like Kubernetes and Docker Swarm do not have multi-tenant networking support at all and are not likely to have them soon. This means if you have, um, say, uh, you know, a Kubernetes instance and you decide to divide it and have different user groups interacting on that, there is no network separation between those workloads. So all of the network resources that are visible to one will be visible to another. Um, whereas if you deploy them within Magnum, they're going to get a neutron network that's unique to the COE. So there will be no sharing of the network between two neighboring uh, clusters in the same Magnum environment. The second is you get to choose the COE. So there's drivers today for Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos, and DCOS. So if you belong to one of those religions, terrific. We got you covered. Um, if you belong to yet another religion, there's a place to plug that in. Uh, the fourth difference, or the third difference, is the choice of server flavor. So Magnum is designed to work with Nova, right? It's designed to work with Heat and Nova. And today, it's designed to work with VMs as Nova instances. But it can also work with bare metal machines, too. So if you want to have Magnum clusters that are composed entirely of bare metal machines so that you have containers running on bare metal, that is absolutely possible. Um, and then the fourth difference is that it's integrated with OpenStack. So if you've already got cloud users who are using your OpenStack cloud to create compute instances, storage, all of these things, they can use the same um, cloud identities that they use today in order to create container clusters in addition to what they already do. So this matters because it's offering you, um, your users, a choice of what container orchestration environment to create. It's allowing them to iterate more quickly, right, to create these environments and to run containers more quickly than they could on their own. And it's allowing them to be more agile. Many times when I talk about Magnum, people ask, what's the overlap between Kubernetes and Magnum? Like, isn't Magnum just the same thing again? And we need to make the distinction that we are not in the business of running containers at all we are in the business of starting up the container cluster and handing over the native API, okay? And the native client and the native API is what you're gonna use in order to actually run container workloads on that cluster. So we're in the business of managing the infrastructure, not in the business of managing the application cluster. So there's a distinction between all of the components of your application and the management of those. That's what the COE does. And then there's all of the nodes that the COE actually runs on, and that's what we manage, right? So there's no single scheduler that handles all of the infrastructure management and the application management. They're handled independently. So Magnum is your instrument to do that programmable uh, management of the infrastructure layer. So in the last release, we added a bunch of new features. Every um, Swarm and Kubernetes cluster now has TLS enabled on, it, on its at CD by default. You can turn that off if you would prefer to run that in an insecure mode, uh, but it is now secure by default. We now have a key pair, key pair parameter available in cluster create. So at the time you create your cluster, you can specify the key pair that should be used on the cluster nodes for SSH access. It used to be that you had to define that in the cluster template, which would mean that if you want that to be different each time you create a new cluster, you would need to create a whole multitude of cluster templates. So now that's streamlined. Uh, we added OS profiler support, so you can do request tracing. We added a quota endpoint, so you can now quota not only all of the constituent resources in your OpenStack cloud, right? So today, Nova has, uh, has quotas, Cinder has quotas, Neutron has quotas, right? All of those things still apply but now there's also a quota on the Magnum resources as well. So you can control, if you want to, limit the number of um, Magnum clusters that a user can create, that's possible now. 
And we also have a stats endpoint that will allow you to see how many um, of these resources your various users are creating. So from an operator's perspective, there's just much more information now. You're now able to rotate the certificate authority. So when Magnum creates a new cluster, it um, establishes a, an SSL certificate authority for that cluster, and then it signs certificates against that CA. So if you want to revoke all of the TLS uh, certificates, you can accomplish that by rotating the CA, which would make all of the certificates invalid. And you can run one command as a user to establish a new, uh, a new certificate uh, from that point. So this is the way you handle like the dismissal of an employee or somebody leaves the group. And we also updated the version of Swarm that's supported in the Swarm driver. Now in Pike, we're working on adding support for upgrading clusters in place. So today, if you want to start using, say, a new version of Kubernetes, you want to go from version 1.4 to 1.5, you have um, the existing cluster running the existing COE, and you have to create a second cluster and then redeploy your app into the new cluster and then kill off the first one. It's relatively easy to do if your cluster is small and your quota supports um, being able to create that many new instances at one time in order to do an upgrade. But if you've got a giant deployment, um, you might not have the freedom to actually um, create another one just as big in order to move the application from one cluster to another. And so for that use case, we wanna be able to support in place upgrade of the COE. So do a rolling upgrade of the COE without with recycling all of the same instances. We're also adding um, a new feature for node group. So node group is interesting because you may wanna have a single COE cluster that spans multiple geographies or multiple availability zones. So you can have a, essentially a subgroup of servers or Nova instances that are um, independently addressed through a, through a node group. So you can create multiples of these. Today we create two groups, right? One for masters and one for, one for slaves. And you can size them independently, but you can't create an arbitrary number of those groups. So no groups would allow for that. It could also be used for things like having different sets of hardware available um, for different workloads that are tagged in your COE. For example, let's say I've got um, my general compute cluster has just ordinary CPUs in it, and then I've got another cluster that's got GPUs in it as well. I might make that available as a second node group that is tagged with a uh, GPU tag. So when I deploy my application and I have a requirement for requires GPU, it gets scheduled onto the correct node group. And we're also gonna have a feature that allows for you to replace a failed node. So if you have a node um, that something, something went wrong with it and you wanna just say, uh, dismiss that node from the cluster and replace it with a fresh node. Feature for that. This one's out of order, um, but we recently added a, in the Okada release a driver for Kubernetes that runs on top of SUSE Linux and a DCOS driver. In the Pike release, we're gonna be focusing on features that affect scale. For example, we talked about cluster upgrades, being able to um, enable folks who are running very, very large clusters that are impractical to upgrade by uh, creating a second cluster. Additional focus on uh, manageability, resiliency, and modularity. And then in Queens, that will focus, again, to include some more security features as well that are that are on the horizon. So I'll give you one example of this in, on the security side where systems like Kubernetes expect to have access to the infrastructure to do things like add storage volumes or add networks dynamically. In order to do that, they need a credential that allows them to interact with the cloud API, which means that your cluster nodes have security artifacts on them, right? Uh, identity artifacts on them that allow you to interact with the cloud which is great if they were properly scoped to only do the things that your COE expected to do with them. But there are missing features that say what exactly the, that policy is. Okay, so there's a workaround for this that allows you to 
define a policy so that that credential can only be used for its intended purpose rather than a nefarious purpose. So an example of a misuse of that credential would be, oh, I have the ability to add and remove storage volumes. How about I go remove some storage volumes that have nothing to do with Kubernetes, right? That would be a privilege escalation that would be bad, right? So we want to uh, add a, a new feature that would uh, prevent that sort of a misuse. So in Queens, you should expect to see additional um, cluster upgrade enhancements and additional node group features. We actually haven't planned R, so it's not fair to really say what the themes will be. So if you would like to help out, maybe you can answer some questions for me. And Spiros, why don't you come on up? Spiros is our um, release liaison for Magnum and a core reviewer in our group. Thank you for joining me for this part. Um, we'd like to know from your perspective how important is having high performance network connectivity between your virtual machines that exist in your cloud today and your container workloads that are running inside your Magnum clusters. Is this a very important thing, not so important thing? Like how should we prioritize this interest versus others? What do you mean by it? What do I mean? Oh, so today, if you want to have your, um, say one of your microservices in your container uh, cluster, interact with a storage service that's running elsewhere in your cloud. That needs to go out through a network address translation right out through a neutron network onto a public network and then potentially bridged back onto something else. That could be a relatively slow uh, network connectivity path. Wouldn't it be better if you could have high performance connectivity on the private network in a way that bridged in another neutron network? Um, using a courier driver, for example, is one way to accomplish this. We could integrate courier as, as an option to, to potentially achieve this goal. Um, but we need to have an understanding of how important that use case is so that we can prioritize it against our other interests. So can I have a raise of hands for like, don't care? Kind of interested, that sounds good. Or I must have that, that's totally critical. Okay, so I'm seeing some criticals. All right. Next question we have. Um, For storage, do you want to see, so today we have the ability to, for you to define a size of a cinder volume that is attached to each cluster node. So it's going to use whatever your, whatever your active cinder volume is to create those, uh, those volumes. Do you want to be able to use COE native volume drivers? for example, a Kubernetes volume driver or a Docker volume driver in order to access Cinder directly? Or do you want us to compose those and present them to the host as if they're local to the COE? Which is better for you? Okay. Sure, Go, you, you want to come up to the mic so everyone can hear you? The answer is I don't know. The answer is I don't know. But if you could tell me how to solve that, solve people I know who's working on this problem though. But how do I solve this problem? So there's another, there's another, you know, while you're thinking of, while you're composing your question, there's another interest which is, rather than just giving me block storage that's gonna be accessible through a, a volume driver of some kind, whether it be native to the COE or not, um, I would like shared file system on my available between all of my microservices so that they all have a common view of the same data on the same file system. I have a lot of users trying to run Cassandra. Users trying to run Cassandra. Yeah. And do they wanna do that containerized and why? Uh, um. 
because they're killing our resources. Um, because we're running, because we're running out of uh, out of resources. So the idea is to try and figure out how to do it more economically. Which resources are they exhausting? CPU. For storage management, they're running no, out no, of CPU. No, 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 not for. Uh, Help me understand the use case. I wish I could. Okay. I can, I could, I can go home and get and, and do more research and send it home to you. Okay. But that was the. I don't know the answer to your question on the on the dependency. You know the the finite question, right. but that's, that's the use case for it. This is the, try, the, the problem trying to solve, and I've got folks trying to do it on, on volumes at the moment um, because, I, because we also don't have enough ephemeral to try and let them do it that way. Okay. So do you want persistent, th those users want persistent volume support, but you're not sure whether they want it native to the, to the Nova instance or whether they want it native to the container system. If you, you if you come up with an answer to that question and you'd like to share it with us, I will. We meet on Tuesdays at 1600 UTC. I'll be there. And we would definitely love to hear your uh, follow up input. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, so we we have an existing practice for running uh, Kubernetes on on OpenStack that we'd be looking at moving into. Uh, Magnus has provided service at some point in time. Um, the, my concern with the, with the shared file system is that uh, that would take away some of the, the, the labeling around um, availability zones and some of the cloud nativeness that uh, that you would get and potentially bring you back into trouble with developers or, or other uh, other use cases or like that. So I think actually having it at the container, um, the COE level, mm -hmm. is actually a better way to do that, to have the uh, the labeling and markups that are, that are at, that, at that level instead of trying to do some magic there. It's a good, it's a good answer. Thank That's you. Good. You want to do a follow-up question on this? Uh, this is to provision block storage for the container application, right? Right. Okay, for Kubernetes, there are solutions to provide uh, for OpenStack volume types or availability zones. It is exposed by the cloud provider for Kubernetes. And for, for Swarm, uh, we'll have the Rexray driver. So I think it's do this is doable. Well, we've integrated Rexray. We've integrated Rexray with Magnum already. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, we don't have a way to pass specific parameters to the Swarm driver. So if you want some specific tweaking, like specific volume times or types or specific availability zones, you must edit the configuration file of Rexray because it used the default at the moment. So when you do the volume create, it will take the default uh, parameters at the moment. Okay. All right, and so our last request is to give us feedback on what your expectations are for cluster upgrades. Um, we do have specifications that are available for review for what the cluster upgrade um, plan is today. We're planning on streamlining the, that and shredding it into smaller deliverables so that we can get them more quickly to you. Um, so if you have input on what you care about the most, uh, what you're expecting from a cluster upgrade process, um, we could take that input today um, because we're going to continue to do additional planning uh, this evening actually to, um, to decide what to, what to deliver first in terms of cluster upgrades. So, so the, the current goal is to do rolling upgrades by node replacement. And the very first implementation, because we want to take the most direct path to have, to have it working, is we will have a very small downtime in the API server of, uh, of the cluster. So example, for example, in Kubernetes, um, the API server of Kubernetes will be unavailable for a little, for a little period of time but the application that runs on the Kubernetes cluster won't have downtime. So if you run an application, the application won't have downtime, downtime but the Kubernetes API will. And, and the goal is to, have, to do the upgrades in two steps. One step is to upgrade the master with, with some downtime, and then do a rolling node replacement for all the worker nodes, and it is expected to not have any downtime for that. So the first step is not to do in place. It's an enhancement. 
to do in place. And a recent feature, we, a small working item we came up with recently is to save the state of ETCD in a block storage volume in Cinder. So even if something goes wrong or anything happens, the state of the cluster is available. So even if something goes terribly wrong with manual intervention, you can bring up the cluster. And you've seen that actually go wrong before, right? You've had users that tried to do an upgrade using the native tooling and got halfway through. Yes, but that wasn't the business of Magnum. No, I mean, but that was a COE malfunction, uh, right? A COE upgrade malfunction. No. No. OK, I misunderstood. No. All right. So any questions you have about the project, how it works? Oh, you want to, Ricardo, come? Yeah. On the upgrades, because we were mentioning the two steps between upgrading the master and upgrading the nodes. Yeah. So um, I think the question is for everyone, what's the expectation of who does what? Like, uh, is it, do we force users to do this or do we just notify uh, or do we just let them do at their uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely interested in the answer to that question. I can tell you what GCE does, right? Yeah, that, that's the main. They, they upgrade the master, <laughs> yeah. whether you like it or not. And then you've, you've got to upgrade your slaves on your own. And, and I and that, think they give, you can be back, you can stay in another version up to two versions back from the master. So I don't know. After that, your clusters break. Exactly. Yeah. So from the operator's perspective, uh, is the, how do we monitor this? How do we make sure that all these clusters get upgraded and things like this? I think that's an open question. So how do you want to run your user's experience? Do you want to force them to upgrade or do you want to allow them to run old versions perpetually? Um, should we have features that allow for this? Or should we, you know, should we expect that you're going to behave in a way that's similar to the way that Google behaves? We're not sure. So. Let us know how you, th how you feel <laughs> so that we can be sure to accommodate your expectations. If you know now, share. If you, if you don't know, um, maybe think on it and let us know. <clears throat> In the case that you create cluster for your, clusters for yourself, you're the user and the operator, so it doesn't matter. You do whatever you want. I've got users that I can't convince that they're not on VMware anymore, and they scream and yell and ask us to help them uh, get their VMs up when they can't get them to reboot. You think I'm going to be able to get them to upgrade when I tell them to? So you want to have back, back it, version support that's indefinite in that case? Not indefinite, but at least a few years. Okay. Um, oh, and the other requirement for upgrades, I would like it uh, as much as possible for at least for my better users, by the way, I do. I'm on the. We have a multi-tenant internal private cloud. If that makes any sense. Um, for my users to be as independent as possible, doing their upgrades without us on the infrastructure team having to help them. Okay, so so the sense. ability for the operator to conduct to, to the update, entire upgrade to, to do their own upgrades within their own clusters. Okay. Would be great. So, so just to be sure I've understood your, your, your question, if you have a sophisticated them. user who wants to do a self-driven upgrade to allow that to be possible without operator involvement. Yeah, that, okay. would, be, that would be amazing. Yeah, I think, I think we're going to cover that. So the, the current implementation will be, will have only that option for users to upgrade from, for themselves. So that covers it. And that also supports that also supports your desire to allow old ones to exist because they'll just never make the choice to upgrade and they'll continue to use the old version of the driver. Would right? be great. Yeah. And they need to not have admin. They do, and, it, and there needs to be a requirement that they not, having admin privileges nope. needs to not be a requirement. No, nope. it should be, they yeah, it should be fine. Credentials. Cool. The, reason why, the reason why that isn't required is that all of the cloud resources that compose your cluster are owned by their tenant, by their tenant. not by a right. not by a cloud owned resource right right yeah there's, there's one detail there, though, which is come to the mic yeah, sorry. just a follow up the, the, the reason i was asking this is that there's one detail is that users don't necessarily know what they're running on the nodes 
because they just deploy the cluster and it might be atomic 25 but if there's a security thing as an operator you're probably interested in notifying having a, an easy way to notify the users that they probably want to upgrade if if there's something that they really want to do and it will be at their so, rate and that their decision but the channel to communicate this uh, well what mechanism do you use to communicate a you must upgrade your um, VM because it has a shell shock vulnerability in it. What, right. what mechanism would you use for that? No, but, <laughs> but that's, that's their VM that they deployed with their image. Right. In Magnum, they see the Kubernetes endpoint. Right, they don't so they see, don't know. Right. They don't see what the node is running. It's our decision as an operator to decide I'm running Atomic version X or Curl S version Y. Right. So they won't see this. So that's why I'm asking this. We probably want this mechanism somehow. To, mon to monitor. Hmm? To monitor what is running. Yep. And, to, and to tell them, look, your cluster needs an upgrade. What if we, what if we emitted an event, um, a notification event, onto the, the OpenStack notification bus, that, like a new, a new event type that is re upgrade required? And that way you could, you could integrate whatever system you wanted to that notification, right? Well, it could be just a notification to their... But it would have, it would have the tenant ID and the cluster ID in the notification, so then you can consume that message using you know, whatever, whatever your communication system is and say, um, you know, owner of this cluster, I know it's... It, the, however, whatever the contact details are for this person, and I know... Right that it's an upgrade required because reason, right? And I can then generate communications, automated communications to request that action. Right, so yeah, some form of notification. Going back to the Google example, uh, it's, it's how it's done. They upload your, your master and they notify, it says at your will to upgrade whenever you want, but this upgrade is available and right. you might want to do it for this reason. Okay, all right, we'll do some thinking on that one. Since we use um, Fedora Atomic and CoreOS, we have a kind of control uh, to what the users are running, and we can filter by that. We could add it to the stats API or something, but if they run their own images, that's another story. So if they run their images, they are independent. So for public uh, cluster templates that the uh, operator chose to advertise, we can control that by using this type of operating systems, I think. Okay. What other questions or concerns might you have that you'd like to share? All right, should we wrap? Yep. All right, thanks everyone for your time and attention. <laughs>